Before we get into any statistical content, I think it's helpful for us to put statistics in context for why we would be using it. And this brings us to the discussion of epistemology and the philosophy of science, both of which are huge topics and could be courses in and of themselves. Starting with epistemology, epistemology is a branch of philosophy concerned with the nature and acquisition of knowledge. Specifically, what is knowledge, how can we acquire knowledge, and to what extent is it possible for an entity to be known? Basically, how do we know what we know? Now, I certainly won't have an answer for you of what knowledge is, but at least we can think a little bit about how we can acquire knowledge. It'll be useful for us to lay this out diagrammatically, but I want to caution you that this will be a tremendous simplification of what is a very complicated area of philosophy. But let's first think about ways we could know the world. And what we're going to do is distinguish, in terms of their formalization, different procedures in the world to know. Now, on the other axis, we can think about what governing philosophy there is behind a method of knowing. Now, I want to start at the far left with the idea of rationalism. Now, if you haven't taken philosophy in a while, I'll explain rationalism is just the perspective that reason is itself a source of knowledge superior to and independent of sense perceptions. Now, just a moment to pause and talk about some notation. When I put a little notepad on a slide, this is a definition I've included in the journal that accompanies the lecture. You'll also find this definition on the wiki page. So rationalism is this perspective that reason itself is a source of knowledge. And if we were to take a strong position of rationalism, we would say it's independent of and superior to our sense perceptions. So a strong rationalist like Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, or Kant would probably take this view. Descartes is a good example with geometry. Geometry is not particularly based on anything we observe. It's simply something we can reason through and it's independent of our sense perceptions. So that's rationalism. So if we think about a dimension of rationalism starting at the lowest, this would probably just be casual thought or casual reasoning. At the most extreme, the most codified formalization of rationalism, we can talk about logic. To remind you, logic is about the most principled reasoning we can do. So for example, a syllogism, which I'm sure you've all heard, starts with a premise, all men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, which necessarily entail a conclusion. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. So notice that through this deductive logic, we've been able to gain knowledge from simply the premises and knowing how to operate on them. Now, syllogisms come in different forms. We can talk about a statistical syllogism. This is actually argument from authority, argumentum ad vericundium where we can say authority A holds that X is true, whatever X is. We know that A is a legitimate expert on the subject, and the consensus of experts agrees with A. Thus, there is a presumption that X is true. Notice this still has the form of premises and a conclusion, but this is in deductive logic. This is a more inductive logic syllogism. Now, going back to our diagram, let's think about the other side of governing philosophies. Rather than rationalism, empiricism. Now, empiricism is the perspective that knowledge and evidence must be based on that which can be physically observed. Strong empiricists would include Bacon, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume. Now, these empiricists would say that observation is the critical way we know things about the world, that evidence must be based on that which we can physically observe. Now, as far as the dimension, the low side of empiricism would probably just be casual observation. And the extreme finds us in the domain of science. And science is the most principled of empirical observations, and one that we afford a special epistemic status. Now remember, epistemology is our study of the acquisition and nature of knowledge. So to say that science is granted a special epistemic status is for me to say that we regard claims made from scientific enterprises to be somehow different and somehow better than claims that are made by a non-scientific enterprise. Now, we can think of science or calling something as scientific to be a qualification for a special type of competition. David Austin, a philosopher at North Carolina State, has a nice way of thinking about this, sort of like the Olympics. You can qualify to participate in the Olympics, but that doesn't mean you'll be victorious. To qualify for the Olympics is to say that you've achieved a certain status or you are of a good enough quality to actually compete in that playing field. Science is the same way. We only afford certain enterprises the ability to compete in the scientific playing field. 
So to call something scientific is not to say it's right. It's not to say that it's won the competition. It's to say it's worthy of competing in the competition. Now, I find this way of thinking about science to be very appropriate. To say something is scientific is really not to say it's right, but it is to elevate it to be eligible for the rigorous competition in the battlefield of scientific discourse. And make no mistake, science is a battlefield. So if we're going to call something a science and in so doing elevate it to this special status, how might we be able to distinguish a scientific enterprise from something else? For philosophers, this naturally leads into the need to demarcate science from pseudoscience. And like many things in philosophy, it's given a name. This is known as the problem of demarcation. Now, to demarcate something is just to say to distinguish. So how might we, on one hand, classify things that we think are sciences as science, but not include things that we think are pseudoscience in the same classification? On what criteria, or on what criterion, might we be able to make this distinction? Now, this is one of the few philosophical problems that has an immediate practical consequence. We give grants and federal money to scientific endeavors, but not pseudoscientific endeavors. Science can be taught in school, whereas pseudoscience is not. How might we be able to distinguish these two so that we can make sure to classify things we want to count as science as actually scientific, whereas things that we know to be pseudoscience counting not as science? Now, to think through this problem, it'll be helpful if we take some examples of scientific endeavors that we can agree on and pseudoscientific endeavors we can agree on. That way, we can see what differences we can find between the different exemplars. For science, I think the quintessential example would be physics. Very few people would probably argue with physics being counted as a science. Now, for pseudoscientific examples, we have a couple of options. The quintessential example used in philosophy would be astrology. But if you would rather use an example that is proven to be pseudoscientific, we can use the power balance power bands. In fact, power balance was sued and had to admit that their wristbands were a scam. So these examples we can use as our exemplars for pseudoscientific endeavors compared with the quintessential example for a scientific endeavor, physics. So on what criteria or on what criterion might you distinguish the pseudoscientific examples from the scientific one.